Um, I think uh, great to start the, the day with immunology lectures. And I, I think vaccines have taught us a lot about immunology. But unfortunately, immunology doesn't teach us very much about vaccines because none of the vaccines that we use at the moment have been designed by immunologists. They've, they've just all been designed by trial and error. But then they've been used to understand how they work and how we, and, and the immunology. So it's the wrong way around. We need to move to a point where the immunology is driving the vaccine development. But uh, one of the things that's important is that we can use the immune response um, to uh, try to work out mechanisms of protection once we've made a vaccine and how uh, and then perhaps um, persuade regulators um, that these are important and can avoid us doing very big trials. So the first thing to say, though, is that if you can show efficacy for your vaccine, that's enough. Uh, that you can get licensed with that. So if you can do the studies to get efficacy, then, then you're already um, over the line. Um, but if you can find correlates, so these are uh, immune measures that relate to protection, you can avoid doing lots of bridging studies and life. You can just go to the regulator and say, I've got the right level of antibody, and so we know the vaccine will work. So correlates can be very useful uh, to avoid doing very large trials, to bridge new populations, and it keeps the regulators happy. And the regulators in the room are all smiling now and looking very happy. Um, so how do we measure correlates? Well, uh, they're usually measured by blood tests um, that measure immune responses, and uh, they usually then have to be related to efficacy. Do so does the immune response that you're measuring relate to the efficacy um, of the vaccine? And there's two main ways that's done directly, where you take blood from everyone in your trial and see what level of antibody relates to protection. But actually, in very large studies, mostly people haven't done that. It's too difficult to take blood from everyone in the trial. You think of the COVID trials. Some of them had 40,000 people in them. And the developers who did those very large trials didn't collect blood from everyone. And so they then have to do statistical relationships from the population, the levels of antibody across the whole population to then relate that to protection in the population. So those are the two main ways in which that's done. Now, Stanley Plotkin has done a huge amount of trying to describe correlates and understand them. And uh, these are some of the definitions that um, he put together about um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And he's actually moved on from using these definitions now, um, but they're quite useful for this lecture because they help give a framework to understand a little bit about why this area is so complicated. And so we're going to go through um, some of these during the course of this talk. So, of course, the first thing you have to do is define what you want to measure protection against. So is it infection, either local or disseminated infection? Is it disease, uh, mild or severe disease? Uh, or is it something else like the cost to the health system? You want to, you know, the main thing you want is a vaccine that's going to reduce the burden and the cost on the health system. Um, or, or is it one of these other factors? We'll, we'll look at some examples of that. So first, some of you might be aware that there's recently been some transmission of a virus called COVID-19. And uh, this is some data from the UK. And you can see the, these uh, transmission um, plots. I mean, they're, they're just showing the number of cases. Um, the original virus on the left, not, not very much testing done, so we didn't know um, how many cases there were. So it looks like quite a small peak. And then the alpha peak, and then delta, and then Omicron. So each of the emerging variants um, over the course of that time. Now, from uh, the middle of 2021, so the, roughly the middle of that graph, everyone was vaccinated. And so you, when you look at this, you might say, well, the vaccines didn't do anything. So what's the point in doing correlates? Because they, they didn't protect because there's, there's lots of infections. And that's because what we really wanted in a pandemic is a corridor protection, not against infection, which we know we're not very good at preventing infection, particularly with emerging variants. You want to be able to prevent severe disease. And now you look at this plot, which is death, and this is telling you that there is an amazing relationship between the vaccine rollout and essentially pandemic levels of mortality ending. And so if you if you have mild disease as your endpoint with a rapidly emerging uh, variants of a virus, you might look as if your vaccine is no good at all, even though it was stopping people dying, which is what we really wanted vaccines to do. And you can see here very clearly that distinction between the two. And that's a real challenge for vaccine developers who came a bit late, because when they were very early, so the. Uh, the Pfizer's, uh, the Moderna, um, Novavax, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, all of those that came early were able to show protection against infection 
because the virus hadn't mutated and so you could see high efficacy. But if you did your trial a year later, as lots of variants were emerging, you wouldn't be able to show protection. And you couldn't do it against death because even with a trial of 40,000 people, there's just not enough people dying in the trial. And so you end up unable to measure that as an endpoint. So what about some other diseases? Varicella, um, we define protection as clinical uh, disease. Uh, rotavirus is prevention of hospitalization. So it's really critical to understand what it is that you're trying to prevent in then working out what your correlates will be. And we have uh, ways of uh, trying to think what you might go and measure. So one is um, if we, for example, look at um, our babies protected in the first three to four months of life from maternal antibody. And that tells you that some form of antibody is likely to be an important correlate. So you can go and search there. Um, we can uh, look at immune responses that we just described in efficacy trials, relate the immune responses you can measure in the trial to their protection. We can look at immune responses um, in protected cohorts to see, and that's coming back to that um, whole population observation. You might look at um, individuals in immunosuppression. So if you miss a particular bit of your immune system, does that make you susceptible to the disease? And if that's the case, then maybe that's where you should go and look for your correlate because the, 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 you get susceptibility when you're missing that, uh, that part. Human challenge studies, um, you may hear about during the next two weeks and how those can be used for correlates. And we can extrapolate from animal studies where we found things in animals that uh, protect them. Now, importantly, uh, the mechanism of protection is not necessarily the same as the mechanism of recovery. So if we take um, varicella, um, everyone would recognize this um, as chickenpox, um, a disease which is extremely common um, uh, everywhere, slightly different epidemiology in different parts of the world. And if you have no antibodies, if you can't make antibodies, which is this genetic condition, um, the course of the illness um, with chickenpox is exactly the same as the course of the illness in someone um, who has a normal immune system. So that is, is that telling you that it's not antibodies to protect against chickenpox? Is that right? Does everyone agree with that? Everyone's nodding. Good. Um, so no antibodies. Your illness is exactly the same whether you've um, had, uh, whether you've got, um, when you get chickenpox as, as someone who's got a normal immune system. This is a child uh, with HIV infection and disseminated chickenpox. So this individual, sort of following on from what we've just said, is someone who doesn't have T cells and therefore gets incredibly severe chickenpox. So both of those features suggests that you need T cells to protect from chickenpox. And everyone, everyone's still with me and they're nodding. But the vaccine uh, that's used, the chickenpox vaccine, has a correlative protection, which is the antibody response. So if you get a good antibody response with the varicella vaccine given in many high-income countries um, to children, um, that on the ELISA, if you uh, measure uh, the fourfold rise, you can see a high uh, level of correlation with that antibody response and protection from varicella. So now, it, now this is suggesting it's antibodies. And the answer um, is quite simple, that what's happening is that antibody is required to prevent infection. So it neutralizes the virus. So if you've got maternal antibody, you don't get chicken pox severely in, in infancy. So the maternal antibody or um, zostrum immunoglobulin, if you treat someone to try and prevent severe varicella with a passive antibody, those protect you. And the, and the vaccine also protects through generating antibody, protects you from infection. If you give antibody to someone who's already got chickenpox, it does nothing. Once you've already got the infection, it's no good. What you need in that um, situation is T cells. So antibodies are preventing the infection. T cells are then limiting it once you've got the infection. So although when you look at the data you, that I just showed you before, you might think it's all about T cells, it's not, it's all about antibody. It's not the T cells. T cells are critical for limiting infections once they've happened. As that's sort of repeating that point. Now, the, the next, uh, I, I think, important thing to think about when you're thinking about correlates, and sorry that this has uh, somehow gone extremely small, but it's a large challenge dose. So if you get a large dose of the pathogen, you can, you can overwhelm immunity that you already have. And so that then creates a problem in trying to understand the relationship um, between your immune response and protection. Because if, if uh, people in the front row get a very large dose of COVID from me, assuming I'm one of the other people affected, 
And then uh, even though they've all been vaccinated and they've got good levels of immunity, they might still get um, a bad COVID because they're getting a big dose. But you at the back, you're too far away. You might get a very small dose and your immune system will cope with it. And so it might look as if you've got different levels of immunity required for protection, but it's actually more related to the dose of the virus. And uh, this is an example of that uh, where uh, children were challenged with oral polio vaccine and uh, to look at how much was shed in the stool. And the difference um, here in the, uh, is that some of them had previously been given the oral vaccine and some of them had previously been given the in inactivated injectable polio vaccine. And you can see here that um, if you um, give um, a high dose um, of uh, the, uh, the oral challenge, you can overcome the immune response, which, which is, is there from the previous vaccination that should be stopping infection, but you can overcome that. So you can see um, here that you go from, uh, with the oral vaccine, uh, only 3% of people shed if they've been previously vaccinated with the oral vaccine. If you give a high dose, you can overcome it a bit. But with the injectable vaccine, with a low dose, um, it, you only get about a third of those uh, will shed. But if you give them a high dose of oral polio, about 70% will shed. So the, that's just showing that the immune response can be overcome if the dose of the virus um, is high. Um, so just before we come on to that one, so th this, this is extremely common in, in, with, with viral infections. So if you think of chickenpox in a family, the first child who gets chickenpox usually gets it from someone that they meet briefly at their, perhaps at daycare. And so they tend to get a milder infection with their chickenpox. And then they go home and they take it to their siblings and they, they're around with the siblings all the time. The siblings get a huge dose of the virus and they get much more severe chickenpox. So dose really matters, both in terms of overwhelming the immune response, but also in severity of infection. So the next um, uh, thing to say is that almost all of the vaccines that are used, possibly all of the vaccines that are used, protect through antibody. And we, we, I can argue with Clara later about BCG. But, but essentially, um, we're um, making vaccines protect through antibody responses. And so be suspicious of anyone who says that vaccines work through T cells. We'll, we'll come back to that. So this is uh, the list of the correlates that are used across many of the childhood vaccines. And you can see they're all antibody correlates. Um, there, there's levels of antibody which have been established I'm not sure I believe all of them completely, but they are established and accepted by regulators, which means you can license vaccines as long as you reach these levels of antibody. So they're, they're really important correlates. Um, now, they sort of related to that, and it also comes to this issue of the dose question, that the correlates might be relative. It, it may be that unlike in, in this table where you've got an absolute level, which has been um, agreed internationally as the level of protection, but it may be that it's much more fluid than that. And that, that's what I mean by correlates can be relative. And this is, this is almost certainly the reality with almost all infections, that there isn't an absolute level. But if you have that, you can say that person is protected. It's much more likely that there's a lot of noise around whatever that level is. And this is a, a, an old slide uh, back from 2004. Um, which is of uh, RSV, which is very topical. I'm sure you'll be hearing talks about RSV because of the many new vaccines, five new vaccines uh, uh, expected to be licensed in the next few years for the elderly, multiple products for infants. Um, and this is um, a plot which shows uh, hospitalized children, which you can see in the, uh, the, the open bars, and non-hospitalized children in the dark bars. And what you see uh, along the x-axis is the uh, neutralization antibody. And so these people here have got very high levels of antibody, and these people here have got very low levels of antibody. And if you look at this end, people with high levels of antibody, these are babies when I say people, these babies um, uh, with high levels of antibody are much less likely to be hospitalized. But there are still some who end up in hospital despite having high levels of antibody. And at the other end, uh, the, these are very low levels of antibody, more likely to be hospitalized, but there are some who are not hospitalized when they get RSV, despite having no antibody. So there's no point there where you can say, as long as you've got this level, you're not going to get um, hospitalized with RSV. There's, there's, no, there's no absolute cutoff. At a population level, you could have a probability where you no know, 90% are not 
going to be admitted to hospital, but there won't be an absolute level for an individual. And a lot of what you see in the tables of correlates of protection don't tell me about you. It doesn't tell me about whether you're protected. It tells me that if the whole population has that level, you've got a pretty good vaccine. But it, you never can really be sure about an individual. Here for COVID-19, these are levels of antibody. Um, and uh, what we've uh, got here are um, people divided into different groups, um, those who are asymptomatic, those who are negative. The levels of antibody in a population vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccines uh, doesn't determine whether or not that individual will get a breakthrough infection. This is, this is before the variants emerged. But you can do um, correlates analysis where you look at this probability um, question and you can work out um, a level of antibody um, at which your relative risk of infection um, is a uh, 50% or 80%. And so that then allows you, whether it's in neutralizing antibody or in total antibody, you can estimate um, uh, levels uh, on a, a particular assay, the levels of antibody that will correlate with relative protection for that, uh, that individual. And uh, this, this has been, uh, you know, the, the way you can take the data um, to try and make some estimates for that. So this could be useful for uh, licensing within populations, as long as the virus doesn't keep changing, which unfortunately it does. But if it had stayed the same, you could use these sorts of data to say, well, if you reach that level of antibody, you'll have a vaccine which will work in most of the population. There's a big focus also on the, the antibodies being functional. So it's not just a question of measuring the level, although that would be the ideal, certainly the easiest to do, but that they have to do something useful. And there's quite a lot of work done to try to understand what exactly um, might be uh, the measure. So here, uh, this is um, from 1969. Uh, Goldschneider did uh, an analysis of levels of antibody in the population. And these were functional antibodies which were able in the laboratory to kill meningococcal bacteria. And they're complement fixing antibodies. So a subset of the antibodies that we make um, to this organism. And what you see here is uh, the epidemiology, uh, first of all, where there's the highest rates of disease that's occurring in the under twos, and then really very low rates of disease as you get older. And so that is the, the typical pattern of the men meningococcal epidemiology. And you can see that this entirely relates to the antibodies. So there's a big drop in this, these bactericidal antibodies. Um, this has come from the mother, very low levels by a year of age, and slowly during childhood, the level of antibody rises to reach adult levels in the, in the population. And uh, so this uh, was then used to show that this particular functional antibody correlates with protection against meningococcal disease and has been accepted by regulators. So as long as you reach um, a titer of uh, one in four um, uh, of the bactericidal antibody level, then regulators will license a meningococcal vaccine. They don't need an efficacy trial. They've accepted uh, that these data um, that originally derived from this study um, uh, mean that you'd be protected if you had this functional antibody. But uh, of course, um, it, it's always complicated. Um, so here uh, you can see if you measure just by ELISA, so this is just the total amount of antibody, um, that whatever age you are um, with, with this vaccine, you can see there are immune responses um, in this study. Um, so uh, one year olds, 93% made an antibody response slightly higher in adults. But if you look now at functional antibody, um, the, there's very little of this antibody that can kill the bacteria that's, that is uh, within this total antibody. There's only a small proportion of individuals who actually have functional antibody which can kill the bacteria. And that uh, beautifully relates then to the efficacy in uh, Philip DeWall's study in Canada, that if you had no functional antibody, essentially the vaccine didn't work. So function seems to be quite important for, at least for this um, particular vaccine. Um, I'm not going to talk about this slide. You can read it, read it um, uh, in, the, in the pack. But it's, it's basically, it's that you need these antibodies to fix complement. And so one of the reasons that we knew that <clears throat> was that individuals with complement deficiency get meningococcal disease. And so it's quite, you know, but by ob observing... Um, a deficient population, you can start to understand the sort of thing that you might look at um, in order to understand which functions may be important. Similarly, here for pneumococcal disease, 
we know that um, individuals who have no spleen have particularly uh, a particular susceptibility to pneumococcal disease. And the, uh, that's because our spleen uh, contains phagocytes, which are constantly sampling the blood, looking for particles. And if uh, pneumococcus gets into your blood, the job of the spleen is to recognize it and remove it from the blood. So individuals um, who, who have no spleen um, uh, have a very heightened risk of getting pneumococcal disease because that function is no longer happening. And you can improve that uh, the function um, if you've got good complement levels and if you've got antibody through vaccination, that makes it easier for the splenic phagocytes to recognize pneumococcus in your blood and to remove it. And so that's, that's uh, thought to be why uh, vaccination is, is uh, protective because you're inducing these antibodies. And so regulators not only require now um, demonstration that you've got the right level of antibody, but also that it has this function, the phagocytic function. Um, so it can, the antibody can bind onto phagocytes and uh, uh, it, it, uh, help them to ingest the pneumococcal particles. So again, functional antibodies become a really important component of licensing um, for, uh, for pneumococcal vaccines. Now, I want to just very briefly here now talk about um, hamsters. And I know we're really mostly talking about human vaccines, but this is hamsters in the context of COVID-19. And I think very nicely highlights some of the things we've just been talking about. So uh, I think it's generally um, was agreed with regulators that you needed neutralizing antibodies to be induced by COVID vaccines, because that's what what's protects. And I think no, one, no one's shaking their head. So hopefully everyone agrees with that. So these are um, hamster lungs um, sometime before lunch. So hopefully you'll have forgotten this by the time lunchtime arrives. And uh, th this uh, hamster was challenged with the alpha variant, uh, B117. And this hamster was challenged with the beta variant. And these lungs are really bad. They, they're well, not, I mean, obviously dead, but, but they're, they're really badly damaged by um, the, uh, the infection. And you can see uh, lots of inflammatory infiltrate in the tissues. And this brown here is the virus. So these hamsters are, have got a huge amount of severe lung disease, like humans got in 2020 and, and early 21 with, with the transmission of COVID. Now, if we vaccinate these animals with a COVID vaccine, uh, you can see that there is a very good uh, res response here against, this is, these are neutralizing antibodies against the alpha variant. So what you would predict is that a vaccinated animal would be protected. Oh, and unfortunately, that's um, got covered up in the way the slides have gone across. But I, what I can tell you is this is a completely normal hamster lung. And there's no virus in the lung that you can see at the bottom here. So vaccination, as you would predict, neutralizing antibody, prevented infection, and prevented any of the lung getting infected. But what you can now see on this slide is that Vaccination uh, with the COVID vaccine did not induce antibodies against the beta variant and uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so you might say, well, it's, it's not going to work. So the, the hamsters won't be protected. But actually, when you then look at the, these vaccinated animals, their lungs are absolutely pristine. They've got complete protection. There's no virus in the lung. And that's because neutralizing antibodies are important for prevention of infection in the upper respiratory tract but they don't seem to be the functional antibodies for preventing severe disease in the lung. And so the, here you can see the difficulty. We, you know, we've got done all this work on developing COVID vaccines. We know that you've got to induce neutralizing antibodies, but actually it's not the critical thing for the end point that we care about, which is lung disease. And we, we still don't know what you need to prevent lung disease. We don't have those correlates, uh, despite lots of effort to try and bring more certainty in that space. Now, interestingly, if you look in the upper airway of these, the, the, these vaccine, the, these um, animals here had no virus in their upper upper respiratory tract. But these vaccines, these hamsters uh, that had um, the beta variant challenge, but had protected lungs, they do have virus in their upper respiratory tract. So they're like us. They've got really good protection in their lower respiratory tract, but they can still get COVID and spread it around. And so that's, uh, I think, a really nice example of a model that quite um, uh, closely relates to what happens in humans. 
So what, what is protecting in the lung? Well, when you look at uh, other types of antibody function, we're only measuring neutralizing antibodies in laboratories, but there are many other types of antibody function. Antibodies can bind onto lots of different cell types and induce uh, functions like uh, NK cell activity, neutrophil phagocytosis, um, uh, and other types um, of uh, so subsets of antibodies that are not generally measured are all produced and may be very important in protecting the lung. And then, of course, it could be that T cells are involved, but we're going to keep that quiet. Uh, it, another complexity here is that often uh, there are more, there's more than one factor um, that's involved um, in protection, for example, mucosal antibodies. Um, this is um, a, a study um, of... Um, a chimpanzee adenovirus um, and uh, um, a, a second um, a viral vector called um, MVA, which was encoding a malaria antigen. Um, and there's, there's a lot of um, analysis which was done here, but I'm just going to show you this um, plot, um, which shows that there were many different features. They measured loads of things in this study, and, there were, and they had some efficacy, but there were, there were lots of different features which correlated with protection. There wasn't just one thing. Um, so here you can see some ELIA spots. These were T-cell ELIA spots. There's some ELISA correlates. So anything with a circle around it means it was significant. And so they found many different features uh, within this study that related to protection. And so that perhaps suggests that there are many different bits of the immune system working together. And yet we generally um, try and focus on one thing because it's easier. But the, the reality is probably much more com complex. Um, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Now, we, Claire Anne earlier mentioned memory, and is going to come back to that. Um, but, it, but it may also be um, quite an important measure. So, for example, in the situation of hepatitis B vaccine, um, after you've been vaccinated with hepatitis B, you might hopefully make an antibody response. But over the, the years or decades from infant vaccination, that, that antibody may completely disappear from measurability in the blood. But there is still memory, as, as you heard before. Uh, memory will be there over a very long period of time. And uh, you can see that uh, efficacy stays very, very high, even though there's no antibody you know, a couple of decades later when the individual is exposed to hepatitis B. So it's entirely memory, um, which is the critical correlate protection. And we sort of work out whether you've got memory just by saying, did they make an antibody response initially? Because if they did, they will have made memory cells as well. And so the correlate is memory, but it's uh, slightly complicated. And the only bit you can measure is the antibody. It, it, it is much more complicated. Um, so th this is um, uh, the correlate of protection for Hib antibody, um, 0.15 micrograms per mil, so very, very low level of antibody required for protection. Um, and I have in my blood 100 micrograms per mil. Um, but unfortunately, it's incredibly low avidity antibody, and you need to have high avidity complement fixing antibody to protect you from Hib. So if you were to just measure Hib antibody, which is what most laboratories do, and you would say that I was protected because I'm above the correlate, but you know, when you look in the laboratory with the functional assays, there's no protection. Um, now, I don't know whether I should worry about that or not, but... Um, so what about herd immunity? So this is this is another um, form of correlation that we need to consider. So if you vaccinate part of the population, is the rest of the population um, protected? So uh, very briefly on herd immunity, this is a, a group of um, ADVAC course attendees. And uh, you can see um, the pathogen um, arriving uh, amongst you. Maybe this is COVID this time. And it gets transmitted from, let's hope this doesn't happen, yeah. transmitted from person to person. And there's a susceptible individual. And that susceptible individual then uh, becomes sick. Hope, hopefully hasn't died, they're just sick. Um, now, if we then, in that population, introduce vaccination and then uh, allow the pathogen to come into the population again, now the pathogen can't continue to transmit because there's enough people who are blocking transmission. And so the susceptible individual no longer uh, becomes unwell. So if we can measure herd immunity, in, you know, and there are different ways of doing that, by doing carriage studies for carried organisms, uh, by uh, doing uh, trials that um, allow you to measure the herd effects as long as the um, number of endpoints is frequent enough, you can start to get a, a measure of whether vaccines have this additional benefits of blocking transmission and what level of coverage you need 
um, to do that. So here, when the, the group C meningococcal vaccine was introduced in the UK um, back um, in, uh, uh, I've come completely blank of what year it was, uh, 1999, um, you can see that uh, there was a fall in the the rate of disease in uh, those under 19 who were vaccinated, everyone under 19 received the vaccine in dark blue, but also everyone else in the population in light blue um, didn't get the disease either. So it stopped transmitting because those who were responsible for transmission, which tended to be younger adults and teenagers, um, were fully immune. And so they, they no longer acquired the organism. So here's a, an example of herd immunity, essentially wiping out disease um, in those who are the carriers and the transmitters, as well as um, other age groups. What, what do we got? <laughs> well, if, if we have one half time oh, for questions. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to go very fast. Two, three minutes. I just want, yeah. So, um, so that surrogates have been, uh, as another word that's commonly used when we're talking about correlates, and I just want to explain how confusing this is. And um, so surrogate is, uh, I think, is generally thought to be something which is statistically related to a correlate. So in other words, something you can measure easily um, that is statistically um, gives you an idea about a correlate of protection, but it's not the correlate itself. It's not the thing that, that protects you. Um, so it's one step removed from the correlate. The problem is that the definition of a surrogate is different in different jurisdictions. And for example, um, the uh, European Medicines Agency essentially define a, the surrogate as being the same as the correlate, whereas the FDA correctly uses the correlate to mean a correlate. And so it's really important when you're reading the literature to understand w what you're actually reading about, because people seem to be very confused in different parts of the world about um, what, uh, what they're talking about. So it's just to mention surrogates are a bit confusing. Um, so what about T-cells? I just want to finish off um, uh, on this. What about T-cells? So this on the right-hand column here is the list of T-cell correlates uh, for childhood vaccines. And you can see the list is completely blank. And so that's, that's why I've had this anti-T-cell view. Um, but we do know that you need T-cells to provide help to B-cells. So there's no doubt that they're a critical part of the immune response. Um, the difficulty is that uh, we're not very good at knowing how to measure them. And because the only compartment we have really access to is the peripheral blood, and we only have a limited number of assays that we can use to, to study T cells. And so we use those assays and say, well, that, that, that means that we understand T cell biology. And so we can say something. But it may be that you need to be sampling the lymph node or the bone marrow or some other tissue in order to really find T cell correlates. So there's a, a real problem of being able to find uh, where those are. Now, we have um, uh, uh, T cells. Um, that may be important in another varicella-related disease, which is shingles. And there's some evidence from um, studies that if you have more uh, be better T-cell responses, um, and this is in a, a trial of an immunosuppressed population, uh, that you have better protection against shingles. So that sort of suggests that, again, remember that with shingles, you've already got the infection, and so you want to try and limit its ability to come out and cause the rash, um, that T-cells may be important. And so that um, uh, is, is almost certainly the case. But it, it, it does seem from some recent literature that it is complicated and that antibody may also be playing a role in protection against shingles. And, and obviously the shingles vaccines, the new ones, are very much inducing antibody rather than T-cell responses. Um, but T-cells definitely seem to have a role here and, and uh, there's been measured. There's lots of other new ways that you can start to um, look at correlates. We've got many more tools um, that clearly relate to protection against infection, whether it's gene expression, it's system serology. There are lots of ways of doing that. So to try and um, summarize and simplify what we've been talking about, um, essentially there are lots of different things which happen during the generation of the immune response um, to a vaccine. And what we're really interested in is the mechanistic uh, way that uh, things uh, protect us from infection. Um, but actually, there may be many other things going on which you can measure and that still may correlate with that. And those are called surrogates in some of the literature. And it's certainly worth thinking about this pathway uh, where there's some things which are directly on the pathway to protection and then the mechanism um, itself. So to conclude, um, so if you want to make a correlate, the first thing to do is to uh, decide 
what your vaccine is going to protect against. So you need to just you know, work out, are you going to look for correlates of protection against infection, disease and so on? And to work out where you should look in the immune system, go and look at what's happening in biology, because there are lots of mistakes that are made in humans and animals that give you a, an, an idea of where you might go and start looking in this complex thing called the immune system. Um, if, if the answer is uh, T cells, uh, uh, you really need a lot of immunologists um, to, to be employed to try and make some sense of it. But if it is antibodies, I think we can celebrate. Um, so really important that once you've got it, call it a correlate. So everyone is absolutely clear that you're serious and that you now have a correlate protection. It doesn't matter whether it's a relative correlate or it contains the correlate or a surrogate, just call it a correlate. Um, and functionality is important. So we've talked about some of the functional assays. If you can get away with not doing these, it's a much easier pathway because these are really hard assays to standardize, to persuade regulators you've got the right assay. If you can do it with a simple measure of total antibody, that's going to be a much clearer, a cleaner pathway forwards uh, than, uh, than everything else. And so HIB, I mentioned, is a good example of that. The correlative is, is a level of antibody. It's easy to, to do, and the assay is a little bit... Uh, quirky sometimes, but it's easy to do. So you just have to measure one thing. Um, really important to consider uh, memory and the importance of that and the impact of herd immunity. Um, but if you can, uh, make sure you find a correlate because it's going to save you a lot of money in vaccine development uh, as you go forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, I think we have 10, about 10 minutes question, Max. Uh, okay, so let's start here and we'll go like this. So I'm Natasha from India. So in one of your slides, I understand uh, when you said that higher dose of vaccine in Im immunocompromised individual can yield better protection. If, is no. that yes? No, I, I, what I was pointing out was that higher doses of um, the uh, the pathogen can overcome immune responses. So, I, I mean, it, it's true that high, uh, higher doses of vaccines can give better protection, but I, that wasn't what I was talking about. <laughs> okay. So is there a uh, uh, next question uh, related to this is, is there any country that is actually utilizing this opportunity as a program? What, what, utilizing what? Like giving higher doses of vaccine to help immunocompromised individuals? Um, th there are um, extra doses given in some programs to the immunocompromised um, to try to induce better immune responses. And that, that's true for a number of different vaccines. Um, you, you again hear about prematurity. So some countries use extra doses for premature infants to try and get better immune responses. So, the, But higher doses, I think other than things like influenza, which uh, an, an immunocompromised group called the elderly uh, respond better to higher doses of flu vaccines. Head B. Head B as well. Head B, yep. Okay, let's go up here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Isaac. Uh, given that the um, autopotassium, as we mentioned, is fluid and relative, do you think we have to define it based on, for example, whether the transmission in a place is high or low? And also, do you think gender plays a role in uh, autopotassium? Well, I, I think that whole question of force of infection is, is, is a very important one. And I, it, where it's going to really play out uh, in the near future is with malaria vaccines, uh, where force of infection is very different in, in different populations. Um, but uh, I, I think it is true that in some settings, there is evidence that you may need a higher correlate of protection than in others. And that's probably related to force of infection. Um, but th that isn't something which so far regulators have required. Um, they, you know, but things like pneumococcal vaccine, it's, uh, there's a number of different trials that are fed into the correlates that uh, were then used, including trials in, in high income and in uh, low income settings. Um, but there is some evidence that exactly as you say, that force of infection may affect the, the level that would give the same amount of protection in a population. Dennis, you have one? So, yeah, first of all, I didn't see TB in your list of correlates of protection. Uh, you easily left that out. <laughs> um, but no. uh, the, my question is, uh, you also highlighted that, that in many cases it might be memory that is the correlate of protection. We just learned from Claire Ann's presentation that, that uh, we cannot measure that in blood. How do we uh, go on with that in clinical development? 
Well, in, I mean, you can measure it in blood. You can do B cell memory, Ellis spots. You can do T cell Ellis spots. So you, so you can demonstrate. The problem is that, particularly in infants, the frequency of those cells is extremely low, and you can't take large volumes of blood to, to look for them. So it can be very difficult to, to measure it. Um, so in, in terms of how you can demonstrate it, the simplest way is to give a, another dose of vaccine, and you see the memory response compared with a naive group. Um, who uh, then uh, don't you know have a lower response to the to the booster? So recall. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. One here and one here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Rita. So one question: so as we're getting into more vaccines with different right. modalities, how would how would you think about correlates? Uh, for one disease from one vaccine applying to a, di a vaccine that works perhaps in a different way? Well, I mean, it's really a regulatory question. Uh, I mean, it, 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 if, if you can show that um, the correlate is induced and, we, and you're confident in that correlate, then you should be able to move between different platforms. And there's some examples of that within COVID where you no know, data from the viral vectors and RNA vaccines was used to license uh, some of the other vaccines. So it, it is possible to do it, but it, it does raise questions. You, you're getting quite different immune responses, different quality response, different T cell responses. Um, so I don't think, again, because of this problem, this immunological deficit that we have, we don't really have the data at the moment to be absolutely sure from a regulatory perspective whether you, whether you can license something in that way in every circumstance. So more work to be done, I think. Last question, sorry. What other questions on the lunch break? It's the last question here. Yeah. Hi, well, that's that. Um, I was wondering, what does it take for a new correlate to be generally accepted for, for a new disease? Is that a regulatory decision to approve something based on a correlate, or is there another way to get a new correlate? Well, for, for uh, new vaccines at the moment, the, it really is working with the regulators on the correlate because most developers want the regulator to accept it. There's tons of work done outside of that system you know, for example, the, the data I showed you on COVID vaccines, there's, there's a number of publications on potential correlates for COVID. Um, but it, 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 that is difficult because the, the new variants then would have a different correlate. You'd need a higher level of antibody for them. Um, but the, the, the actual two stumbling blocks with those correlates, the first is actually having the data. Um, so I think um, the, the trial that we did in the UK for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is the only one that collected samples from everyone. Um, everyone in, in the trial. And so you could generate a correlate more easily. Um, most developers didn't, didn't do that in the pandemic. So the first thing is, do you, do you have the samples to, to be able to answer the question? And then the other thing which turns out to be really hard are the assays. So you have to get the assay to a standard that the regulator will accept. And particularly when you're coming into the more functional assays, like neutralizing assays, that can be really difficult to do. And to get a, an internationally accepted one that all the regulators agree with is, is difficult. So I think th those are the big obstacles to, to getting this, the samples and the assays.